I'm Denise. I'm the Scottish one. And she's a non-fiction editor. And I'm Louise, the English one. And she's a fiction editor. And together, we're the Editing Podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Editing Podcast. So this week we're going to chat about question marks because while most writers get these right, there are occasions when they come unstuck. Definitely, that's right. And you won't be surprised to hear that there will be times when there's a choice. It's not <laughs> always cut and dried. In that case, we'll be talking probably about fiction. And we can always count on you fiction lot to get the old brain cells working. I know, we like to keep you non-fic peeps on your toes. Though the tricky stuff comes in, up in creative and less formal non-fiction too, I think. Yeah, it definitely does. So the most common use of the question mark in writing is to indicate a direct question. So for example, who was that book written by? Or how fast did he run the marathon? Or, Are you coming to the restaurant later? Will the results be available on Wednesday? Which crime writer do you most enjoy reading? Might I ask for your help? I could go on and on. But in all <laughs> those cases, the question mark goes at the end of the sentence. You're such a beautiful question asker, Denise. I am. <laughs> the skill I have. <laughs> so that leads on to the issue of what an indirect question is and whether you need to use a question mark at the end of it. So an indirect question is a statement in which a question is embedded. So I'm going to take some of the direct questions Denise offered so beautifully earlier <laughs> and turn them into indirect questions he asked who that book was written by she wants to know whether you're coming to the restaurant later he wanted to know if he could have the bill she hasn't decided which crime writer she most enjoys reading now something else we need to mention here is how to statements and question marks now this comes up a lot in blog writing particularly headings so these are examples of headers that start with the words how, which, or what, for example, but they are statements, not questions, and so they don't need a question mark. So three examples, how to punctuate dialogue, which training course to choose, what to look for when searching for an agent. Yeah, now if they were actually questions, they'd be phrased perhaps as follows. How do you punctuate dialogue? Which training course should I choose? Or what should an author look for when searching for an agent? Yeah. So let's look um, quickly at idiomatic phrasing, because this can be a little bit sticky when it comes to question marks. Yeah. So <laughs> we're thinking particularly about questions that are, in fact, more statements of courtesy and um, when the question marks are often omitted. Although I wouldn't want to be too prescriptive about this. Mm, I think mm, it depends on context and author style. So two examples might be, how do you do? And will you please give Louise a big round of applause? <laughs> now, the reason we can, yay! <laughs> the reason we can all be a little bit more flexible is because they aren't really questions at all, even though they're framed as such. Um, in the first case, we're simply greeting someone. We don't expect them to say, oh, I'm having a terrible time, actually. I'm a bad, <laughs> can you imagine? I know, my back's happened? really playing How are you? Up. I'm terrible. <laughs> but I think that's where non-native speakers can have an, an issue with that, yeah, actually. They yeah, yeah. A, a literal response to it. Mm. Uh, and in the second, uh, we're inviting people to clap, but we don't expect them to say, uh, uh, no, we won't, you know. No, we certainly don't <laughs> when it comes to me. And no, not your applause, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, they're actually um, imperative rather than interrogative. Um, so that's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. A little bit of rhyming. Yeah. So let's talk now about questions that are framed as wonderments and thoughts. So in creative writing, sentences like, what on earth had she been thinking, he wondered. That kind of, that kind of thing can fox readers. So yeah. the usual approach is to place the question mark after the question and then follow it with a tag. Um, that's certainly the, the style that a lot of um, uh, style ref uh, reference guides recommend. So it okay. would be, so... Um, what on earth has she been thinking? Question mark. He wondered. That's how you right. punctuate it. And that's because there, there's a direct question, but it's embedded. Um, and we'll come back to embedded questions. But just um, to stick with thoughts and wonderments for a moment, the thing to bear in mind here is that because there's a tag, in this case, wondered, the pronoun he is in lowercase. Yeah, that's a good point there. Yeah, because usually the word that comes after a question takes an initial capital because a mm. question mark is the final punctuation in the sentence. So, yeah, do watch out for that tagging in fiction that Louise mentioned. Uh, now, I do still sometimes see a comma setting off the question and the tag and the question mark coming at the end of the sentence. Yeah, that's true. Though New Hearts Rules and the Chicago Manual of Style recommend the approach we've outlined. So that's what I follow. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. 
<laughs> if they say it's okay, yeah. if it's good for them. It's we'll good go for them. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. And the other thing to mention is that the question mark before the tag functions instead of the comma. So you don't need that comma as well. Yeah. So this issue of wonderments leads nicely into surely and perhaps statements where a question is implied. Now, these come up in all types of writing, not just fiction, and they often get writers in a muddle. So here's an example. Perhaps the inspector would catch the killer after all, or surely he wouldn't believe that nonsense Greta had been spouting. And I see authors placing question marks at the end of that um, statements like that regularly. And you needn't. The words surely and perhaps give the reader everything they need in order to understand that there's in uncertainty. And these aren't direct questions, so you don't, um, you don't need a question mark. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point there because um, it's a bit, it's not clear cut that really is it? I can see uh. how people would would want to put a question mark at the end of that there really. So let's have a look now at embedded direct questions. So the convention for which punctuation mark to use is the same as for the thoughts and wonderments, um, though you'll see embedded questions in nonfiction too, just perhaps offered a bit differently. So for example, the question is, how will a general election affect the mood of the country? Or what is the likelihood of a no deal Brexit is the issue we're all thinking about or trying to avoid at the moment, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and in both cases, a question mark comes after the direct question, though the comma sets off the modifying statements, the question is, and the issue we're all thinking about. Is that clear? Is yep. it as clear, clear as a no deal Brexit? Clear no. to me. No. <laughs> Well, yeah, let's just not go there. No. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's funny because people might be watching this or listening to this like years from now and, and thinking, oh, remember that time when it'll all be ancient history. <laughs> yes. Can't come quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be that it's still relevant. That would be yeah. awful, wouldn't it? I saw a, a, um, a cartoon about that the other day and um, it was two old men talking and saying yes my father was a Brexit negotiator as well, <laughs> <laughs> as well as me. <laughs> uh, just carrying on the family tradition yeah, yeah. yeah. never ending. <laughs> so let's talk quickly about double punctuation because um, this is something that a lot of people ask about so if a question mark comes at the end of a sentence even though it's embedded there's no need for any additional punctuation usually. So if you write, the question is, comma, how will a general election affect the mood of the country, question mark, there's no need for a full stop anywhere. The question mark functions as a completion mark. Yep. Now, there's just one other thing I want to mention here, and that's in relation to parenthetical dashes. So sometimes there are questions that are embedded in a sentence, but, those senten that, but that sentence could stand alone without um, the dashes. So for example, and I'm going to, again, with audio, it's just quite hard but we'll give it a go have a go that deer standing in the road dash or had it been something else question mark dash nearly made me crash the car so that so in that case you can have double punctuation you've got the question mark at the end of the direct question or had it been something else but surrounded by two closed up m dashes or spaced n dashes yeah but if you were using full stops with contractions or abbreviations so say you were talking about times and had am or pm with full points and a question mark followed this construction you would have the double punctuation then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now let's look at some other ways in which question marks can be used to express uncertainty and here we're looking more at non-fiction writing so over to you yeah so you can use a question mark to indicate that dates are uncertain so for example if you were discussing the discovery of an ancient tomb perhaps or the year a war broke out but the date is contested you can place a question mark after the final number Denise, what do you recommend if there's a date range? Because the reader might not know whether both dates are uncertain or just one. Most style guides recommend avoiding ambiguity by placing the question marks against any date that's uncertain. But if you're writing for an audience who you think might not interpret the question mark correctly, I recommend recasting, perhaps with mm -hmm. a parenthetical statement that one of the dates is questionable. And there's no single solution to this kind of problem, and it does depend on the audience. Which leads us to another convention that's acceptable in some style guides, and that's placing a question mark surrounded by round brackets after a word to imply that the information is uncertain. So if I were to write, 
Louise was born in Amersham, round bracket, question mark, round bracket, that would indicate that her birthplace was uncertain. And some style guides ask for the bracket and enclosed question mark to be placed close up to the word that's uncertain. But again, think of the audience, and it might be cleaner and clearer just to write out that Louise is thought to have been born in Amersham. And now everyone's going to be wondering, were you born in Amersham? I was born in Amersham. <laughs> so we, we don't need the question mark then. Just for the record. <laughs> no question mark, no brackets, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> All sorted. Mm -hmm. Now, I have one more question for you. I don't okay. usually see this in fiction, but it might be a thing in nonfiction. And some of the style guides talk about it. And that's question marks that indicate sarcasm. Yeah, I sometimes see this in very informal or humorous non-fiction mm -hmm. writing. So again, the question mark is placed in round brackets, although in this case, there'll be a space either side. So for example, his friends, space, round bracket, question mark, round bracket, space, <laughs> would be sure to help him once they'd heard about his $30 million inheritance. I suppose in that case, you can imagine that those question mark that question mark in the brackets imagine that taking the function of sort of um doing air quotes or yeah yeah quotes or something round yeah. friends yeah you know? and i think i'd be more inclined to do that than to put a question mark i think so yeah, yeah i agree with you yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a it's a funny thing and I, I i i mean certainly that's how um it would be handled in fiction you go yeah quotes um so it's interesting that it's still um considered conventional a way of handling it in yeah. in, in non-fiction um, i th yeah i think i'm seeing that less yeah, I think often it, it probably mm -hmm. depends on the the register of the piece doesn't I it i think so, so yeah so if it's yeah slightly more formal um mm -hmm. it might work um or informal academic maybe but certainly in maybe. an informal like a blog piece it would be mm -hmm. it would be weird it would i think people might be confused by it yeah. actually yeah yeah, yeah. I think it was a typo <laughs> probably <laughs> so um i know that it this <laughs> listening to us talk punctuation i is know tricky. so um <laughs> we'll we will include a transcript with this information in it yeah. so you can see it right now it does get a little tricky trying to show things how things appear on paper when you're working with audio well i still think we're having an easier time of it than we did with that episode on uh, find and replace strings <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Bit of a mare, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. And now it's time for editing bites. And this is the regular bit of the show where we each recommend a favourite resource that we think you'll find useful. So this week mine is Making a Point, the Pernickety Story of English Punctuation by David Crystal. And it's it's both a history of punctuation and a guide on how to use it. So there's lots of very interesting backstory on how our punctuation developed over the years, plus really practical information on how to do things with lots of punctuation marks, not just question marks. Excellent. And mine is, but can I start a sentence with but by Carol Sala? Um, that whole issue of starting sentences with conjunctions and, and ending with prepositions that gets people in a right old nick and not and um <laughs> so this is a collation of some of the most often asked questions um of the staff at the chicago manual of style and the answers are sensible enough to educate and humorous enough to make you chuckle good stuff yeah it's always worth reading carol's stuff mm. she's just got a wealth of editing experience mm. yeah so we hope you've enjoyed this episode thank you so much for listening to the editing podcast you can rate review and subscribe to us via apple Podcasts, spotify or whichever platform you prefer and we've put all the links in um, that we've mentioned in the show notes so you can grab everything there bye bye bye